One of the reasons that I was um, so excited to come to UCSD is that my work, my research is at the intersection of psychology and neuroscience. And for those of you who do not know, neuroscience has made incredible breakthroughs in about the past 20 years, especially the past five to 10 years. The neuroscience community here at UCSD and at the Salk is just uh, unparalleled. It's, it's a wonderful place to work. Now, on top of that, I'm in the psychology department, which since its inception has been one of the top psychology departments in the country. And what I got really excited about is um, some of the work I do, the, the initial founders of the department were the ones who built the very basic psychological questions that now I investigate in the brain. Um, so uh, what, what do I investigate? I'm really interested in how the brain controls actions, right? We decide to make actions every day. We can decide to go for a walk or a run. We decide to have a cup of coffee. We want run or walk because it's healthy for us. We enjoy it, maybe. We drink coffee because it's delicious. And a lot of times we find ourselves making the same action over and over and over again. It becomes habitual. Now, habits are incredibly important. They allow us to move very efficiently in our world. We don't have to stop and reevaluate everything. But we also need to stop when it's detrimental, right? When we need to change our behavior, for example, if all of a sudden we have an increased caffeine sensitivity, we're staying up at night, we need to reduce how much we drink. Now, that seems kind of eh, but habits are fundamental to a lot of disease processes. So a common example is addiction, where a person continues their drinking or their drug-taking behavior in spite of extreme negative consequences. Obsessive compulsive disorder, where someone performs very ritualistic, compulsive-like behaviors and cannot stop, can't break it, and it severely impairs their quality of life. And also gambling, where someone, even though they're losing all of their money, keep putting up everything they have to try, to try to get ahead. And so I've talked to you, or I've mentioned these very human problems and human behavior, but fun for me, habits are seen across species. So this is my grad student, Drew, my first grad student, so that's kind of fun. Um, but his decision-making depends upon a part of the brain called the frontal cortex, okay? So that same part of the brain, that same frontal cortex is seen in monkeys, so rhesus macaques. We've seen habits in rhesus macaques. And then if you can see that really small circle up there, that's a mouse. Mice have a frontal cortex, and we can see habits in mice. And this is really great for me because as a neuroscientist, we can now employ tools to really probe how the brain controls habits. So this is a picture from the frontal cortex of a mouse, and this is called the rainbow mouse, because you can see all these different lovely colors up there, right? What we're able to do now is genetically isolate very specific neurons, and these specific, each of those little circles, that's a different neuron in the cortex. And we can put, we can control the activity of these neurons. So that means that we can ask how very specific parts of the brain, very specific neurons in the brain, are controlling why we make an action. But it kind of comes back to how can we study habits in mice. So most of you have probably heard of a Skinner box, right? Rat pressing a lever. Well, here's going to be a video. That's a little mouse, and it's in a little Skinner box. And what happens is a lever comes out, and the mouse, just by exploring its environment, learns that it can press that lever and get a food pellet. Mice will readily self-initiate and work for food. They'll press a lever multiple times, you can see it, and then retrieve a little food from that food receptacle. To investigate habits, what we can do is we can train a mouse, like you saw, to press a lever for a fun food reward. After they've learned to press this lever, what we can do is we can devalue that food outcome. Right? So imagine if your coffee suddenly tastes really horribly bitter and not in a good way. But what we can do is we can take that food reward that they press the lever for and we can pair it with illness. So if they ate it, they get sick. Or we can give it to them as much as they want so that they no longer want it. But the main idea is that we change the value of what they're working for. And after we've changed that value, we just put them back in that box the next day. We let them press the lever. This time there's no food. But we just ask them, do you want to press this lever or not? So I bet you guys all have some guesses about what you would expect. But you can see here, there's two different bars. 
Okay, that lower bar, bar is something we call goal-directed. That means if you change the value, you make that food reward gross, they no longer want to press. They're not going to press. They don't care anymore. However, if the animal's habitual, they'll keep pressing. Now, this same phenomenon, we can examine it in slightly different ways, but we've seen it across mice, rats, pigeons, monkeys, and humans. So the same task can be applied across many different species, and it's how we can examine how the brain controls habits. So I'm going to tell you about one type of tool we use in the brain to probe how different neural circuits work. And it's called DREDS, okay? And it's a way we control the brain activity. So what are DREDS? Neuroscientists engineered a receptor. It's called the muscarinic receptor. And it actually is a human receptor that they engineered to only be activated by a particular drug. So that means that there's nothing in your body that can activate this receptor. It's only if you give the animal the drug will this receptor be active. So they made this receptor. OK, that's nice. But what we can do is we can take the DNA that codes for the gene for this receptor. We take that DNA, and we insert that gene into very specific neurons in the brain. Now, what happens is that neurons normally communicate by firing. They talk to each other through these chemical and electrical impulses. So what happens when this drug, if you give this drug, it's going to activate this receptor only in those neurons, and we can make this neuron talk more. We can make the neuron fire. So it's a way for us to control the neural activity of a very defined set of cells. So what we want to do is we want to use this tool to investigate how the brain performs habits. So this is a picture of the mouse brain, or schematic of the mouse brain, if you were just to cut it down, the mouse's head down the middle. Okay? So up on top, you can see that this upper layer is the cortex up there. Um, now, the cortex controls behavior through its um, projections down into the basal ganglia. I'm sure most of you have heard of the basal ganglia. It's where changes happen in Parkinson's. So the cortex controls behavior down through the basal ganglia. And what we want to do is we want to control the activity of a particular part of the cortex called the orbital frontal cortex, which has been heavily implicated in how we make decisions, but no one knows exactly how. So what we do is we take, I take a virus that's coding for this dread receptor and it's carrying all this viral DNA and I inject it into the brains of mice, and what's going to happen is it's going to go only into certain OFC neurons that I've pre-identified via genetic means, and what we do is we put a fluorescent tag on it so we can see it. So all those little red dots, those are neurons in the mouse brain that are expressing this receptor. This means that if I give the mouse a drug, those neurons are going to increase their firing. So we take these mice where we have this virus expressed in their brain, we train them to press a lever for a food, and then just during that test session, when I ask them, do you want to press a lever? Are you habitual or not? We give the drug. So what we see in control mice is you see that high bar. It's at 100%. These animals are habitual. If you change the outcome, it doesn't matter. They just keep pressing. However, when we give animal a drug, we disrupt habits and we break habits and we let the goal-directed system take over. By increasing the activity of this orbital frontal cortex, which through additional studies we've shown controls goal-directedness. By increasing its activity, we can have the goal-directed system win out over the habit system. Now, that's just mice, right? So how does, what does this actually mean for people? And what's been some of the most rewarding aspects of my work um, is its application to humans in clinical settings. So this same region, this orbital frontal cortex, has been found across diseases to be perturbed. So, you put people with OCD or with addictions or with schizophrenia, you put them in an fMRI scanner, and you look at the activity of this brain area during different tasks, you see that it's altered. But no one knew exactly how or why or how this led to aberrant behavior. So through our work and some others, if we found that actually, if we actually increase the activity of this brain area, um, it seems that increasing the activity of this brain area helps people overcome some of these um, disruptive behaviors. So how can we increase the brain activity in people? Uh, one way has been deep brain stimulation, right? That's been used to treat Parkinson's, but there's also a newer technique called trans transcranial cortical stimulation, where you place magnets on top of a person's head and you can direct a magnetic field down to a very specific brain area. So by doing these types of studies in this orbital frontal cortex, it's helped people um, stop their persistent or more automatic habitual type of behaviors. So we're really excited about this, but of course it raises a lot of questions. 
So some of the things that I'm doing here in my lab now, which I'm really excited about, is that we're asking how very specific diseases change this circuit. So I'm in particular looking at how alcoholism changes there, or how an alcoholic brain uses these circuits. We're also asking, are there different drug therapies that we can target that would selectively restore this type of behavioral control? And then kind of more fundamentally is, what does this tell us about the brain works? Because what happened is I can take out a habit system and have a goal-directed system take over. We know there's these two fundamental pathways in the brain. What we're trying to do is understand how um, they work to get together to control our behavior and then how that's perturbed. But uh, with that, I'll end and I'll take any questions. Yeah, so the question was about brain injury versus brain disease. So I think most people think about brain injuries as like a stroke, right, or some kind of physical damage. Now, what's been interesting is when there's been a stroke in this area, you see the same type of effects. People seem to be more um, habitual. They can't stop and evaluate their behavior. But at this point, there's a lot less that we can do for that. Brain diseases, if they haven't gone too far, there may be a way to try to pull the proper activity of that brain region back and try to restore it, or at least help it overcome some of its limitations. Yeah, so the question is about what about for younger people versus older people? So unfortunately, younger people's brains, brains, but this is a good thing too, right? They need to learn. They're more plastic. They're more open to change. But um, that doesn't mean that these circuits stop working in old people. They work just fine. Uh, and so it seems it, there doesn't seem to be any age discrepancy. And it seems like generally, and even in older people, that you can still try kind of retrain the brain, I guess. Though I, I hesitate with that language, but retrain the brain is one way to think about it. Yeah, so the question is, is there really any genetic underpinning to being biased toward habits? Now, those studies just haven't been done. There's a lot of similar type of things. We can think about impulsivity or some similar things where they have looked at the genetic contribution a bit more. But so far, we don't know anything about the genetic underpinnings of, of habits. Yeah, so the question is, do males and females differ at all in their habits? And you could imagine how that does. There's male hormones, there's female hormones, and they affect and change the brain. Um, once again, we see habits fairly similarly in males and females, but that question hasn't been that investigated. Where we start to see some differences is in diseases, where maybe males or females may be more susceptible to one disease, and hence it affects their habits. But no one's been able, no one has gotten to targeting that, that, that question yet specifically. Yeah, so, so the question is, is there another way we can target the brain activity besides drugs or some kind of very invasive um, technique? So I'm not a big fan of like the brain training exercises per se, but there are very specific ways we can recruit these circuits. And so what cognitive um, um, clinical psychologists have been doing is taking uh, addicts into the clinic. And these, pe these people have been absent for a long time. And they're trying to have them do tasks which we know recruit this part of the brain. And hopefully by recruiting it, that those, strengthens, well, those circuits will be strengthened. So the more you use the brain, the, the better it is. So there is something to it. It's just it needs to be very focused and directed. Yeah, so, um, so the question is, was I saying something about magnetic fields and on the brain? <laughs> uh, and I was. Uh, it's not what I do, but there's this called transcranial magnetic stimulation, where they put a magnet uh, coil, and they can basically uh, lo uh, locate uh, pretty specifically, though there's some spread, very specific parts of the brain. You can't go too deep. It has to be pretty shallow, but you can, by applying a magnetic current to the brain, change how those neurons um, activate or turn on and fire. And so a lot of really nice work is starting to be done with that. And most, the, so far, mostly it's been in motor, motor control, but they're starting to apply it to depression and habit and OCD. And they're seeing some really interesting, nice effects that are making their way into the clinics now.